Heavenly Father, thank you that you have revealed yourself to us. And today, please um, help us to focus on what Bruce will be teaching us concerning how to defend our faith. And you've given so many things within your scriptures to help us. And please bless him now as he comes to teach us. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to start off just by reading an unrelated verse. Because you know I love the concept of God's sovereignty. And I read this yesterday in Psalm 119, 89 and 91. Forever, O Lord, your word is firmly fixed in the heavens. Your faithfulness endures to all generations. You have established the earth and it stands forever. By your appointment they stand this day, for all things are your servants. Isn't that great? It's like God is in complete control no matter what it, things look like. <clears throat> so today we're going to start talking about apologetics and I hope that if you miss one of these that you'll go back and listen to it because these build on each other. <clears throat> we're going to learn a number of things. We're going to learn how to defend our faith based on what God has the evidence that God has put out there. And there's a lot of it. So, apologetics comes from the Greek word apologia, and it means a reasoned defense. So, the two primary purposes for apologetics are, number one, to offer philosophical arguments and evidence that demonstrate the truth claims of Christianity, that they are true. So, philosophical and evidentiary arguments. Does that everybody get that? Um, and then number two, it's to provide answers to tough questions raised by skeptics about the faith. <clears throat> so, simply stated, Christian apologetics is giving a reason or a defense for the Christian faith. And a a study, a really diligent study, and I, I don't want this to go over everybody's heads. I want it to, I want you to get this. So stop me anytime you don't get something. It's not that formal of a class. A diligent study of this will show us at least three things. First, Christians have never been expected by God to accept the truth claims of the Bible on blind faith. Okay? God doesn't work that way. The Bible actually sets forth a challenge to every human being to weigh the evidence that supports the claim that Jehovah is God. And God has given us a lot of evidence that you are going to see. A lot of evidence for his existence and for the, his creation of the cosmos. And in fact, he's given us so much evidence that when you see this in the coming weeks, you're going to be astounded by what people are re actually rejecting, what people are actually saying, ah, oh, no thanks. And you'll also, if you learn this material, you will be able to easily debunk the claims of the world of t today's so-called experts. Number two, as Christians, we have access to all the evidence we need to help us overcome any of our own internal doubts. And that will come out too. Day after day, we are bombarded by the world with scoffing. Christians are gullible. Christians are science deniers. And sometimes <clears throat> these attacks can be challenging. They can be discouraging. But a study of apologetics can help us to see that there's no truth in these claims. On the contrary, it seems that the world is the one that is gullible and science denying. And we're going to see that. Number three, as Christians, we can share Christ in a way that is not only spiritually compelling, but also intellectually compelling. And for some people, that's important. <clears throat> there's some people that operate on more of an intellectual basis than others. And so appealing to their intellect and their spirit can be very compelling. 
Now, a word of warning, which we're, we're going to revisit this warning from time to time. Our goal in studying this subject is not to learn to win arguments, okay? If you've been at this church for any length of time, and if you've been listening, <laughs> then you should know by now that that's not the way people are saved. First of all, the Apostle Paul says of Satan that he has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. So we know that at the outset that Satan has blinded the minds of everyone. <clears throat> and no amount of evidence can overcome that unbelief. It's only when a person is regenerated that they see it. And, and we know from the Bible that they only get, become regenerated by faith from hearing the gospel. Okay, does that make sense to everybody? This is not a way to witness to people. It's kind of sometimes a foot in the door, and it's sometimes a way around objections that people might pose, but the primary purpose is giving the gospel to people. Okay, so it can be an excellent lead-in for people who are skeptical, but not necessarily hostile. If a person is hostile, the best thing for you to do is to pray for them and to walk away. Okay? So, let's start off the three, there's three sub-disciplines under the heading of apologetics. First is positive apologetics. Okay? Now, this involves arguments for the truth claims of Christianity. Most primarily, those arguments are for the existence of God or the reliability of the scriptures. So you're taking evidence, both philosophical and evidentiary evidence, and bringing it together to show that God exists and that the Bible is reliable. That's positive apologetics. Number two, negative apologetics. This subheading answers objections to Christianity. Examples, somebody say, well, what about this problem, this evil that's in the world? How could a God, a good God, allow evil? Um, that's just one way for you to be able to come back and respond to that is negative apologetics. And the third is actually polemics. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard that term, but the third discipline is what I would call polemical apologetics and it essentially is an attack it is an attack on the other belief systems it's calculated to debunk other people's belief systems for instance we will demonstrate in one or two classes how ridiculous evolution is yes polemics polemical uh, polemical is like an attack, a ta an argumentative attack. And based on the evidence, you're going to see that evolution is absolutely impossible. It's a joke. Yes, you're going to see it in black and white. And polemics is going after those arguments. Now, it has to be used cautiously, and can you understand why? We Christians are not meant to go around offending other people. We should not be afraid to shoot down arguments when necessary, but it should be gracious. Christians should never be argumentative or proud. Okay, keep that in your minds. If that is a problem, you may really consider not using these arguments at all until you get that under control. The other, other basic reason for using caution <clears throat> is what we discussed a few minutes ago. People don't come to Christ through arguments. People are not, somebody is not going to get saved by you proving that evolution is false. They need to hear the gospel, full stop, okay? So if the person that you're speaking to is argument or getting cagey, I would suggest you resort to giving the gospel straight out rather than participating in any type of apologetical debate. 
So that being said, let's talk about the main reasons that the Bible, that we should, I'm sorry, not the Bible, but the main reasons that we should study apologetics. First of all, the Bible teaches it. Every follower of Christ should be an apologist. Now let's just look at a few verses that back that up. Probably the most often cited one is 1 Peter 3.15 that says, In your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it in gentleness and respect. Okay? So the Bible even says, right there, it says, be careful about how you do it. <clears throat> Colossians 4, 5, and 6. The Apostle Paul says the same thing in a different way. He says, walk in wisdom towards outsiders, making the best use of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to you, you ought to answer every person. Okay? And a particularly good verse on the subject, I think, is uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 4 and 5, that says, For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but they have divine power to destroy strongholds. I believe it's 1 Corinthians. I left off the one or the two. <laughs> 1 Corinthians 10, 4 to 5. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. So you see that? The Apostle Paul is saying we should be prepared when somebody comes back with an argument to destroy that argument, as long as we do it in the right spirit. So the Bible is clear. We need to know our stuff. But in most churches these days, if you walked in and asked a person, do you teach apologetics here? They would look at you like, as Errol says, you have three heads and two of them are on fire. That You'd be met with blank stares. What is apologetics? That a lot of them would say. Unfortunately, at best, apologetics is treated as an extra <clears throat> or something to be avoided. And it's going to sound crazy, but yes, there are Christians who believe the use of apologetics is akin to attempting to replace the gospel. And that's why we need to make sure we, we do it correctly. Now, when apologetics is taken to the extreme, that argument is perfectly valid. It's, they're, they're replacing the gospel with reason, and you can't do that. We're not here to go to extremes. We want to use the evidence that the Lord himself has provided in the Bible. When, Psalm said, when the Psalms, Psalm 19 says, The heavens declare the glory of God. Is it wrong for us to go to find out how they declare the glory of God? Of course not, because God has said everything in the scripture for our benefit. He wouldn't just throw that out there and just say, believe it. That's not the way our God works. He tells, he, God tells us, go and prove me. The fact is that God has given us evidence, and he points to that evidence in the Bible. And he also says that evidence is so strong that it leaves believers without excuse. So it stands to reason that we should know our subject, right? Evidence that leaves somebody without excuse. We should know what that evidence is so we can point it out to unbelievers. So number two, today's culture demands that we know apologetics. Christian philosopher, late Christian philosopher, Francis Schaeffer referred to apologetics as pre-evangelism, the idea that God uses well-reasoned answers and arguments as springboards to the gospel. Now, I'm not a huge proponent of pre-evangelism when it's taken to its extreme. First of all, the Bible tells us that faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of God. Done, right? 
So we should not be fooled into thinking that anything else will draw people to the, to the Lord. And secondly, the idea of pre-evangelism has started to take on some really crazy forms. In, the, in, in churches, you know, with people, you know, lining up in, you know, football stances on, on Super, Super Bowl Sunday, you know, with the Bible being hiked. That's the type of pre-evangelism they do. And that can go pretty, you know, we know that's wrong. But that being said, there is some biblical support for this concept of pre-evangelism. Pre it can come in many forms, most of which are intended simply to put a Christian in a position to be able to give the gospel to someone. Think about it. When you purposely establish a personal relationship with someone for the intent of ultimately giving them the gospel, you are pre-evangelizing by setting up that relationship. If you go to work in a soup kitchen, or if you go to work at the Ventura County Rescue Mission, or you go to an anti-abortion rally, if your ultimate intent is gospel-related, that is pre-evangelism. Does that make sense? It's getting you into a position and to a point to be able to give the gospel. When we demonstrate to others that Christianity is not smoke and mirrors, and that our faith is absolutely reasonable and backed by evidence, this is pre-evangelism. If it softens somebody up to the gospel, then you can go for it. If it hardens them, you step back. Make sense? So why is pre-evangelism becoming more important in our culture than it was, say, 50, 100 years ago? Well, it's because unlike in earlier times, our culture is saturated with preconceived, preconceived ideas about Christians. They're hateful. They are stupid. The science deniers, etc. We can go on. We sometimes need to clear the decks before we speak any further. And that's just how it is nowadays. Plus, our culture is saturated in philosophies of three philosophies, relativism, pluralism, and naturalism. Now we'll go through those. Relativism says there is no absolute truth. Keep, keep these in mind if you can. Relativism says there is no absolute truth. Pluralism says there is no exclusive truth. In other words, all religions are equal. Naturalism says there is no supernatural truth. So do you see the problem trying to give the gospel in that cultural climate? We are trying to present an absolute truth to a relativistic culture. We are trying to give an exclusive message to a pluralistic culture. We're saying Jesus Christ is the only way, and they're saying, no, there's many ways. We are trying to give a supernatural view to a naturalistic culture, a culture that says that miracles are impossible. So it's no surprise that Christians are confronted with, with relativistic attacks that says every person has their own truth. Who are you to force your morality on me? That's a relativistic attack. Then there's the pluralistic attack. How can Jesus be the only way? All re religious roads lead to the same place. And there's the supernatural attacks. You are gullible. Science has proven that miracles are impossible. And it's questions or attacks like these grow out of a secular worldview, which we talked about and apologetics can respond to them at the worldview level. Number three, the church needs apologetics. The internal challenges to our own faith and the internal challenges to the faith of our friends doesn't stop when we're converted. And this is another where area where apologetics can help. 
Research done, but yeah, does everyone know what parachurch organizations are? They're, um, they are, they're organizations that are meant to support churches, like for instance, um, Desiring God or uh, what's R.C. Sproul, Ligonier Ministries. These are parachurch organizations that are there to undergird the church and help them. So some of these parachurch organizations have done research and they suggest that about three out of five young people disconnect from the church by the time they're 15 years old. Emotionally, they're gone. They've checked out. And this is not really new. Old Testament, same thing was happening. In Judges 2.10, after Israel finally entered the Promised Land, and after Joshua died, what does the Bible say? And all that generation also were gathered to their fathers, and there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord or the work that he had done for Israel. So this is not uncommon. It's just history repeating itself. It just took one generation for Israel to abandon God and to turn to idols. So one way, way that we can help strengthen the faith of our friends, our family members, and our children, these are people that already believe, is to teach them apologetics. Now think about what happens to kids. They grow up in churches believing what they believe because they believe it, because their parents believed it, because they've been preached at. And when the first genuine attack comes along, it puts them back on their heels. A friend or a professor will give some evidence of why Christianity is dumb, and the, the kid will not know what to do with it. So the faith is shaken to the core. Even if they, now think about it. Even if you see you have a 14, 15 year old child and they get this attack that shakes them like they don't know how to answer. Even if they go home, come home and you help them out with it, that shock of having their faith shaken is not going to go away. They're still going to say, hmm, it just took one question for me to question my faith. So if these kids are taught apologetics at a very young age, that attack won't affect them like that because they'll already know the answer. And the thing is, if they maybe they're still going to leave the church. A lot of kids, it doesn't matter if they have the evidence, if they have the gospel, they're still going to leave the church because they're not Christians yet. But the fact is that a, a, a kid who knows apologetics that leaves the church is more likely to return because they're going to hear this. And I, I can tell you this from experience, me. I was out there in the world, and even though I wanted to be away from God, when I heard these scientific attacks on the scripture, I just knew they're hogwash. <laughs> I knew it because I knew even though I wasn't living a life that was Christian and I wanted to be away from God, I still knew in my head, there's a God. I knew it. So like it or not, the world is constantly preaching at kids and preaching at us. And young people are hearing it. They're hearing that people who believe in God are naive. They're hearing that evolution is a fact. And they're hearing that all of these arguments are beyond being scrutinized. So the church desperately needs apologetics because it ha helps to provide real responses to the reasons people leave the faith. Number four, apologetics bears fruit in the form of converts. Now there are stories I have done, obviously I've been studying this subject for years, and I've read stories on top of stories of people coming to faith in God through apologetics. There's, there's a lot of people that don't, but there's some that do. And those people that do are generally become ex like powerhouses for the gospel. Think about this. C.S. Lewis came to faith through apologetics. 
can't get much more broad than that. You see, everybody knows who C.S. Lewis is, just about. Josh McDowell, ever heard of him? Lee Strobel, J. Warner Wallace. J. Warner Wallace was a, um, um, a cold case detective for LAPD and brilliant guy who used to take cases that nobody could figure out or all the witnesses were dead and used to find ways to convict people. People like these studied apologetics out of an honest heart saying, if Christianity is right, I need to find out. I need to find out if it's true or false. And they studied it and they found out that it was true. People like Josh McDowell actually tried to prove it wrong. And he was an investigative reporter and he ended up coming to Christ because he said the evidence was so strong. So the Bible says emphatically that the evidence for God's existence and creation is obvious. So what would you, what do you say, what do we, what does the Bible say about these people who look at this obvious evidence out there and just say, no, I don't, I don't believe it, I reject it. Well, this is what Romans 1, 19 to 20 says. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. Wow. So it's saying that everybody knows about God because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made so they are without excuse. So there's two ways that God makes his existence known and we won't talk about both of them. One of them is internally. It says God has put it in them so that every person knows that there's a God intrinsically because God has put that knowledge in them. And that can be seen by going out to even the most, you know, you go out to the, the mission fields where nobody has heard of anything to the furthest reaches of the jungle and they're worshiping something. Everybody knows that there's a God. But to those outside that, all we have to do is look up to the sky and see creation and God says, there's your evidence. And God says it, it's so strong that on the basis of that alone, God will judge those who don't believe. Nobody will be able to accuse God of not making his existence plain. Now that means the evidence must be pretty strong, right? I've subtitled this lecture, The Sky is Screaming. And here it is, Psalm 19 says, the heavens declare the glory of God and the sky proclaims the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour out speech. Night after night, they communicate knowledge. There is no speech. I'm sorry, I'm gonna interject a little. Though there is no speech, and though there is no, are no words, and though their voice is not heard, yet their message has gone out to all the earth and their words to the ends of the world, okay? So God is saying, even though you can't hear it, there's no actual words, it's speaking, it's proclaiming, the, the, the nature is proclaiming it. And we're going to see, you can, maybe you don't see that right now, but as we go through this apologetics series, which is probably going to take a long time, we're going to see that every, every part of science points to God. In nearly every area of science, we see evidence that indicates that God, that a God, of enormous power, intelligence, and kindness created everything and everyone for a purpose. In fact, even a child looking on creation, what are the first thing they say? Mommy and Daddy, who made all of this? Right? I mean, I remember saying that when I was little. Um, so th even children know intrinsically that someone made it. 
So in the coming weeks, we're going to look closely at each of these areas. But today, let's talk a little bit more about God's response to those who reject the evidence and how he deals with this. And this is going to help us understand, first of all, why we see such crazy beliefs out there. People thinking things that are obviously not true. But it also describes, this passage that I'm going to read also describes the peril that people place themselves in by, by rejecting God when he's made it obvious. So listen carefully as I read Romans 1, 21 to 32. For although they knew God, so he's talking about all humanity here. Although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. Okay, so these are the science deniers out there, the, the professors that see the, the glory of God, they see all the evidence and they reject it. God says they claim to be wise, they're professors, they got PhDs after their names, but because they rejected God, they became fools. And they exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. So this is replacing God with other things. Therefore God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Here we go. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. For their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men, likewise, gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another. Men committing shameless acts with men and receiving themselves the due penalty for their error. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what they ought not to do. So you see this progression from re the rejection of God to God saying, okay, then I'm giving you over, letting you go with that thought. Go, go with it, your mind. And as a, they go down a huge rabbit hole to the point where they can't think right about stuff. They can't think right about whether a man is a man and a woman is a woman. When God paints the evidence of his existence all over creation, when people fail to acknowledge that evidence, God surely, slowly but surely lifts his protective hand, giving them over to their own inclinations. And this progressive removal, unless God intercedes and the, the gospel hits home, is going to send somebody to eternal damnation. But in this life, it renders them incapable of cogent thought regarding things of God and morality. So once a person has given themselves over to this thought that there's no God, they become slowly unable to think properly. And as a result, they start to swallow whatever is given to them. I want you to listen to a few headlines that I read recently. Analysis of a 300-year-old sponge suggests the world has already warmed by 1.7 degrees Celsius since pre-industrial times. Now, hmm. I thought the Industrial Revolution happened in about 1760. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I thought they, they only started measuring weather about 100 years ago. So how did they measure 1.7 degrees Celsius change before industrial times when they didn't start measuring weather until about 100 years ago? I'm just saying. Here's another one, inner ear fossil from a six million year old ape suggests upright walking evolved in ancient humans' ancestors via three phases. 
Now, so a bone about the size of a half toothpick <laughs> that's six million years old, <laughs> and from this bone, they can tell us that upright walking evolved in ancient humans. Oh, in three phases. <laughs> and, and I'm not trying... I'm not trying, really trying to make fun, although I am. Um, but my point is that people accept this stuff without blinking. They, they read these headlines and just boom, they accept it. And then you, you go into those articles and you expect to sign, find all this amazing information to support the, and you find nothing except for what they say and this suggests and could be. And it's like, okay. And it could be that I just fell off my chair and bumped my head, too. But here again, there but for the grace of God go we, right? If God didn't give us the gospel, draw us to himself, and save us, we would be thinking this stuff, too. Because if there's no God, we got to figure out something, right? So these people, when they believe these things, they go so far down that rabbit hole as to say things like, we no longer need God. We now have science. As if the existence of God and science are at odds. Now, I've mentioned this guy before, uh, John Lennox. He's the retired director of math at Oxford. And he's a brilliant apologist, if you listen to him on YouTube. He's wonderful. And he puts it this way. He said, just because we have the intelligence to understand how an internal combustion engine works, does that disprove the existence of Henry Ford? So he's saying, just because we know science doesn't mean that we have any basis to deny the creator of that science. So the danger here is that anyone who continues to reject God in spite of the evidence and in spite of God's universal call, excuse this term, they become dumbed down. And they become hardened to the point where they're no longer capable of clear thought, much less repentance. So. What kind of evidence is there? In the coming weeks, we're going to go through the various fields of science. And we're going to go over many of these individually. And here's just to mention a few. We're going to discover evidence from time, space, and matter, which is cosmology. We're going to look at evidence from the planets and stars which is astronomy. We're going, to st we're going to look at evidence from philosophy. That's ontology. We're going to actually look at that one next week. Um, or the week after? Week after, yeah. Um, then there are evidence from design, which is called teleology. Evidence from the fossil record, archaeology. Evidence from mathematical consistency, physics and evidence from life, biology, and then evidence from the building blocks of life, microbiology. So it's pretty extensive. Every area of these sciences has Christian science scientists that have shown that the evidence for God is amazing within each one of those sciences. sciences. And don't forget about plain old common sense. In the late 1700s, an English clergyman by the name of William Paley, he observed that the universe exhibits design that lead to a common sense belief in a God. He, think that, he said that every created thing has purpose and relative beauty. So for instance, the eye was created for a purpose. And it has its beauty in its way. Nothing in the human body, as a matter of fact, lacks purpose. 
So this argument is also known as the teleological argument, telos being the Greek word for end or purpose. But in his analogy, William Paley described a person walking through a forest who stumbles on a pocket watch. Now this is back in a long time ago. This, and he said, did this object just appear on the forest floor? Did its parts fall out of the sky and accidentally form into this object that ticks and seems to keep time? Or would common sense reign? Was it designed and built by someone and then accidentally dropped in the forest? So the point is that the universe, and you're going to see this in coming weeks, the universe shows every sign of having been designed as a matter of common sense. To say that a person can see design in a watch, but not in a person, is ludicrous. But even more basic than the design of the watch is the nagging question of why there is a watch in the first place. Why is there something instead of nothing? Even the most ardent evolutionist who believes that the universe came from nothing does not apply that belief to their personal lives. Nobody believes that things just appear or evolve in this day and age. So an evolutionist will say, all of this appeared out of nowhere. But if you told him that that watch on the desk just appeared, he'd say, absolutely not, that can't happen. A trash can is lying in the middle of the road and you have to go around it in your car, right? You automatically assume that it dropped off a truck or that the wind blew it there, right? And even more basic is that you know that someone designed that trash can. Nobody in their right mind is gonna say that it evolved and made its way to the middle of the street by itself. And that, that's exactly what the world wants us to believe about creation and human beings, that we all just involved, and in fact, we evolved from nothing. It's, I like this, R.C. said this, it's like a magician pulling a rabbit out of a hat, except there's no rabbit and no hat. Oh, and there's no magician either. So, Let's face it, if I say that a watch was created, that admits only of a person that created the watch, right? But if I say that I was created, that admits of God. And if there is a God, then I may not be able to live the way that I want to live. So that's ultimately why people deny that God exists. They want to write God out of the equation because they don't want people to tell them how to live or someone to tell them how to live. But God does exist. There's a popular Latin saying that you all should learn, and it's called ex nihilo nihil fit. It's Latin for nothing, I'm sorry, from nothing, nothing comes. So how do you start with nothing and get to something? Or should I say, if you, how do you start from nothing and get to everything? As Aristotle used to say, nothing is what rocks dream about. So next week we'll start to dig into this stuff. I'm, I keep saying next week. Next week is home fellowship, right? So the week after, we will start to dig into this and we'll go into it with the ontological argument, which is the argument from being. It's a philosophical argument. It's going to be, I think everybody's going to really enjoy this. So I hope you're looking forward to it as much as I am. Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love for us and, and we thank you that as God, you haven't called us to just step out on blind faith, but you've actually said, try me, look at everything that's out there and prove that I am God. Lord, thank you so much that you've done that for us. It, it increases our confidence in you as a creator that, that we are not 
forced as human beings just to to rely on one thing or another out of blind faith. Lord, we thank you that you are who you are and that you have saved us. Lord, help us not to be proud in our beliefs because we know that without your grace, we would be that way too. Lord, help us as we go and hear your word preached today that we would respond in the way that would glorify you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.